What is happening, everybody? Welcome to Off the Rails, a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. My name is Mark, and with me always are Dave and Jared. And today we got a special guest. Jared's going to introduce him. Yeah, today we got Nate Smitty on the show, and also known as Narcan, Narcan Nate. He's a activist and a harm reductionist, and we're very excited to hear his story and uh, all the cool things he's up to. Nate, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Sorry it took so long to get here. Oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, we're just happy to have you here. Um, right on. Man, before, uh, before we start, I just wanted to say thank you, dude. Um, I, uh, I stumbled across your Instagram, and uh, I found it like super inspiring and motivating. And, uh, you know, it kind of, kind of gave me the kick in the ass. I, I wanted to get out in the community and, you know, I started volunteering with like a soup kitchen and stuff like that, man. And you kind of, you kind of got me into that. It's just been amazing. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I'm glad I could inspire you. That's awesome. So Nate, uh, a lot of times, uh, we'll just get our guests on, uh, we get, we get to kind of share their story and, uh, hear what they're up to in recovery. So we'll probably start right from the beginning, man. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Jellico, Tennessee. It's like East Tennessee. It's the middle of nowhere. It's like 1,500 people. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. So what was life like growing up? Um, my parents got a divorce when I was five. My dad was drinking a lot. Um, he was drinking really heavily. My mom was in and out of the picture um a lot of times and so when, we, when my, my dad worked two jobs to raise us and we were we would bounce back and forth between my aunt's house so we would go there um after school he'd pick us up and then i think thursday friday saturday he worked two jobs and so he'd pick us up we'd either stay there or he'd pick us up at like two in the morning and take us home so he worked a lot um and it was just real chaotic bro um my mom she went to jail for it. i i mean so she she kidnapped us. I mean, for lack of a better term, she, she kidnapped us. We were gone. She like brainwashed us into thinking like my dad was going to do some bad shit to us. She was like, Oh, he said he would take you off in a bag or something like that. I don't know, man. I was like six, seven years old. And, and she took us to DCS and she tried to get custody over us um, and stuff like that. And she brainwashed us, like tell them shit, you know what I mean? So she put it like a, like a, like a, a message in our ear to tell the, the department of children's services. And then she got arrested there, did some time and got out. Um, and then my dad still let her come around and then she disappeared for, I didn't talk to her for, um, probably I thought I was, I don't know. I was probably seven, eight then. I didn't talk to her again. So I was like 19 kicking dope for the first time. You say us. Um, so obviously siblings. Yeah. I got a brother. He's five years older, five years older. Okay. Yeah. I was just yeah. curious. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. So Nate, what was your, uh, like first experience with using um i was i was a junior in high school and we had just won like the regional tournament basketball and i remember we were leaving and i asked my dad for like 20 bucks and i already had money in my pocket and we were i don't know what i told him we were going to use it for but we ended up buying beer with it and um we went to what they call the quarry and um i drink i think i drink like 15 16 natural lights i went home and puked like i'm talking from my friend's porch onto the road like projectile vomited and it was so bad it was horrible and his mom and dad are there so I wake up the next morning I'm hung over I have to deal with his mom and dad I'm like I just you know I mean if you've ever done that it's like not a fun experience and I was like and I really didn't party that much like the rest of junior year I was like no I'm done yeah, <laughs> yeah. learn your lesson there for yeah while. yeah yeah so what did it uh, look like after that you took a little break yeah, I took a little break. Senior year, um, all my fr all my all my friends at skate, um, which I skated to, um, but they they were they were smoking bud, and I was like, I remember being in well, I was like in economics class or something like that, talking to this guy, and I thought he was talking about smoking weed, and I was like, man, I want to smoke weed, and so I was I was co oping out of school, so I went for like two periods in high school, and then I co opted out and went to a job. And they just happened to pay me cash every single day, which was like, like just already money, you know, just, just like awesome. And so I see this dude there that I know. And I was like, Hey, 
can I get some weed, bro? I got like 10 bucks. And he like brought me like a bud like that big. I bought some paper and some and some cigarettes and went to the skate park after work and just rolled up for the first time and got so, I mean, just smoked. And uh, and then I just smoked every day after that. And then like my whole senior year, I was just smoking and drinking every single day. Um, that's that's all it was. Did it uh, like kind of escalate from there or anything? No, honestly. Um, I mean, I, I was just partying every day. Like if I, I mean, if I wasn't doing it, I was thinking about it. You know what I mean? Um, but then I started selling drugs. And then when, when I started like actually like having weight, um, this was probably um this was probably i'm out of school so probably a few months after i'm 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 graduated i would have like i don't know a half pound or a pound in my truck or you know half pound in my truck half pound at home and like i wouldn't smoke or drink during the day i would only smoke like half a joint before bed and then just like give it to somebody or whatever just roach it cash it um because i was more into the money part you know because there wasn't a lot of jobs where i live and i was like i was working in this gas station but I was selling from the gas station and then selling when I wasn't at the gas station. Then I had people sell for me at the gas station. You know what I mean? So it was, I was more into that. And then eventually probably like six months later is when I started doing opiates. And that's when, that's when things went, that's when things snowballed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's when it got real. Yeah. How, uh, what was that first time like that? Oh man. What was that like? It was like an orgasm in my mouth. No. Um, <laughs> so fucking good, dude. Um, yeah, I, I went to cop. <laughs> I went to cop, man, and uh, fucking. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I went to. I was going to get some. I was going to re up with, and, and my girlfriend at the time had broke up with me. And dude was like, "You need to liven up," which is slang for you need to like get in a better mood. And uh, and so he pulled out the old like Roxy M Block Thirties, the real ones, you know, uh, M Block Thirties, and he, he split it in half and he chopped me up a line, and I railed it, and I was like, "Oh my god." Like my first thought was I need to feel like this every day for the rest of my life. And it it was like it was like a heated weighted blanket just wrapped around me. And it was the best fucking feeling ever. Yeah, I, I can kind of relate to that like initial <laughs> it's like a euphoria type thing. Yeah. Um, when did it stop getting like that? Oh fuck. I mean <laughs> um it probably I mean I definitely had to start doing more. I mean, at, okay. At the, at most I was spending like three to $500 a day on drugs at, you know, at at the worst of it. Um, it was probably like, if you're talking about when, like I couldn't get high enough to like deal with the problems or the pain that I was masking that probably took, um, that probably took like four years for me to get there where like, I couldn't get high enough, you know, where it was just like one day, like, I like got loaded, but I wasn't, I just couldn't get fucking high enough anymore. You know what I mean? Like I had to be absolutely completely foobar. Did you have to, did you have to sell it to support it too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was selling to make a profit at first. And then like, I was just selling to like get high and then I'm being a shady drug dealer. I'm like taking like 0.25 quarters, taking 0.5 out and selling 0.2 for 25. You know what I mean? Just being shady and shit like that, you know, doing dumb shit like that. So Nate, was there a point where you're like, fuck this, like, let's, I'm going to change? Um, nah, I mean, that wasn't until like 20, that wasn't until like I got sober this time. Before that, it was usually like somebody else wanted me to change and I just went along with it to do what they wanted me to do, really. Um, I got, so I got sober and the first time I got sober was 2015 and, or no, 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 no I take that back. It was like 2000. It was 2011 and um, I just overdosed. And apparently I told my family, I told my dad I would go stay at his house and like kick dope. And I don't ever remember saying that. And, um, but then they picked me up one day and I, I, I couldn't like fight my dad. My dad's like six, six, like two sixty two eighty. He's a big motherfucker, dude. I was like one ten, sunk up and like five, like five eleven, dude. I was like, dude, I can't fight this motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was just like, um, and he took me up there and he didn't like, he just like, he like took my keys, took my wallet and took everything. And he took my ass to work and made me work dope sick. And it was fucking horrible. And I knew if I got loaded again, I was just going to end up having to like do this again. I wasn't going to like get away from my fucking dad. 
And uh, so I just like kick cold turkey. He would have me outside in his garden, like raking like fucking potatoes and shit. And the fuck, it was it was in the middle of summer, dude. It was like a hundred degrees outside, and I just wanted to fucking kill myself. Oh, during, awesome. during that during that time when you were using a lot, did uh, like your old man was he um, was he kind of just letting you figure it out on your own until till the end there, or was he always trying to kind of get you back on the on track? Um, he. I think for the longest time, like I hit it from them pretty well. Like I didn't stay with my dad. Um, but I think some of my family members knew, and I think they were either afraid to tell him or didn't have it in them to tell him, or they had like, um, they were in denial about my drug use and the first, they were in denial for like two years until I overdosed for the first time till, well, till then. And, uh, cause my dad's a cop. So I don't think they had it in them to tell my dad that I was getting loaded and doing the shit that I was doing. Um, and if he did know, he didn't know how bad it was um, because he – there was, like, one point where he went through my truck, man, and I, like – I just – I had so much shit in there, dude. Like, oh, my God. And he was like, what the fuck, you know? So – but after that, he was supportive of, like, trying to get me right the most part. Did you ever uh, go to rehab at all or – Yeah, um, 20 – the first time was 2015 um, – I just got robbed by some homies. They robbed me, and um, I was in the Suboxone clinic then, and um, I, w- I didn't have enough money to get to, like, okay, I didn't have enough. I don't know if you know how the Suboxone clinic works, but you go your visit, and you get your meds, and um, I didn't have enough to pay for my visit and get all my meds out, so I was like, Dad, can I use your money to go to the Suboxone clinic? And he didn't even know I was fucking in there, and he was like, no, your ass is going to treatment, and so they took me to treatment. For the first time how was that experience um absolute fucking hell um <laughs> when i got there the admissions guy pulled me outside because i told them how much subs i or i told him how many milligrams of subs i was on and i was also on clonopin and he pulled me outside and he was like dude do you realize how bad this is gonna suck i was like well i don't know it's gonna suck period just kicking dope dude like what the fuck <laughs> and he was like he was like well i'm just gonna tell you right now that you'd be better off to go shoot fucking heroin and come back in a month you know what i mean that's what he that's what he told me swear to god that's what he fucking told me and he wasn't lying man like kicking subs and colonopins was absolutely a fucking nightmare like it was so bad like i was going in and out of psychosis and shit like that and i knew if i opened my fucking mouth and told those people what i was seeing and hearing they were gonna fucking 51 50 me and so i was like smart enough to know that this like like this is valid for me but i was like i can't open my fucking mouth it was so fucking hard not to open my mouth because I didn't want to get 5150. Yeah. So I don't know if that makes sense or anybody's ever had that experience, but I was like I, losing uh, my mind. Yeah, I've uh, I went through a like a couple years of psychosis and it's it's very relatable, man. Um how, how long were you at the the treatment center, the rehab that time? I did I did five months there, like willingly, because I, I wanted to get better. Like I really did. Like I I caught on to the program, you know, I got a sponsor, was going to meetings. Um, I ended up, uh, I had commitments um, and stuff like that. So I caught on and I think, and then that point, um, I think that time around, I got like 16 months um, in and then relapsed. How was the relapse? Oh, it was gnarly. I mean, that one wasn't bad. I mean, I like, I relapsed and then I told my roommate that I relapsed. I quit my job and went to a meeting picked up a white chip and was just like i would get two weeks and then go back out get a day go back out get like three days go back out i was just a fucking mess for like the next i think it, i don't know 14 16 months something like that i was just in and out like that did you go to uh did you go to another treatment center after that um it wasn't until 2000 that was in like 2000 i want to say that was either the end of 2000 16 or the start of 2017 um or somewhere along that line and then i didn't go to treatment until march of 2018 what stuck for you this time well i relapsed one more time after that and um honestly i just got the shit scared out of me you know what i mean because for one i just kept having anxiety attacks and i i mean i'm not a doctor but i'm pretty sure i was developing like agoraphobia and that scared the absolute shit out of me. I was like, okay, I've, I've overdosed before and I've survived. Like I've never, like, I've never been to jail. Like I've sold drugs for like eight years, never got caught. 
never went to jail. Like, I'm like, okay, so that's not happening. I was like, what if I lose my fucking mind and have to get sober, but I'm a fucking psycho? Like, how fucking shitty would that be? And that scared the fuck out of me. And like, seriously, I mean, and I'm still like, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I see people out on the streets that like, they're either like in psychosis, usually like just smoking dope all day. And I'm like, dude, I do shit like that sober. Like, what the fuck? I'm just like, God, I'm like, I'm so fucked. You know what I mean? Because like, they'll be talking to themselves like about some situations that even happen. I'm like, dude, I talk to myself about shit that's not even happening. I'm like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> um nate i know you do lots of service work and help out a lot with the homeless and stuff did you ever find your were you ever homeless or living on the streets at all through your active addiction um for a little bit like not not a long time at all i mean probably the worst of it dude was like i mean it was cold in tennessee um but that's the only place i was like sleeping in my truck and shit like that or there was this trap house, which was, or it's just, it's this crazy story, but it was like my house that got, got like turned into a trap house. And there's like, they're like selling mad dope out of there and fucking, they're not letting the dogs out to go piss or shit because they're fucking twacked out. And the only, <laughs> so I, I just got kicked out of the sober living. So I go there, I'm like, hey, I need to crash. And then I get spun out on meth. And, um, the only place I had to lay my head was this couch and the couch was tracked in like dog shit and piss because they would piss and shit on the floor. And then they would like either walk through it or they would like the floor was like hardwood. So they would sweep it up and then it would like get in like the like, grooves and shit. Like it was hard to get like all of it up. And then they would like get on the couch and walk on it. So I would have this hoodie and these like sweatpants that I would just, just only wear when I wanted to lay down on the couch. And then, when I wasn't going to lay down on it, I would take it off or do what the fuck ever. It was an absolute, it was just fucking horrible. Like I on the regularly envisioned myself breaking these dogs fucking necks. Like, <laughs> seriously, seriously. So, I mean, seriously. Uh, <laughs> that sounds horrible. Oh, yeah, that's shit. brutal. Yeah, it was not fun. And then, no, check this out. Check this out. And the fucking hoodie that I had was from a fucking convention from like a year ago. So it had the little <laughs> logo here. It had the fucking saying on the back of it, like from the convention. I was like, this is some fucking bullshit. <laughs> it, was, it used to make me so mad. Um, I would like see the little symbol from the convention. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so so like while you're living in a like in a house like that are, are you in like is in your mind are you just hating it or are you just like just oh, high dude, I, and just it, not really caring or it, it was horrible like okay so i had worked most of the steps before that relapse and like prior to that i had worked i had worked like up to the eight i had worked like eight of the steps and and so you know there's this saying i don't know if you guys do the, or 12 steppers or you do any of that shit but there's a saying like, you know, once you work the steps or whatever, like you just get a, um, a belly full of dope and a head full of AA or NA or CA or whatever the fuck you work. And like, I would be in there and I would have this, all the shit from the book just running through my head and I couldn't get high enough to cut it off. And it was so, I, like, it was so fucking bad. Like there'd be people doing like shady shit. And I'm like, oh, well, this is the solution to that. But I'm fucking over here talking on meth. And I was just like, oh my, I, I could not shut my fucking head up, dude. It was so bad. Like. Like getting high wasn't the same anymore. Like going to the rooms and like working the steps and like having that experience or most of the steps at that point completely ruined getting high for me, like ruined it. And then motherfuckers would be calling me every fucking day to check on me. And I'm like, I fucking hate you. Stop calling. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, man. So what got you, uh, what got you from Tennessee to California? Um, I went to, so I left there, I finally left there and I went to my aunt's and I was like, Hey, I got to go to treatment. And I just, I just ate like a shit ton of gabapentin and just like, just slept, you know what I mean? I slept and uh, it was pretty easy. And, uh, and I went to treatment in Nashville and then they were like, Oh, do you want to go to California? Um, and at the time I was, I was scared. I was getting body brokered, but I didn't get body brokered. Um, and they put me on a plane and I went to, to like treatment out here for four months at an IOP. And I had the body broker question wrote down here for you. Oh, okay. Sick, uh, sick. So do you want to explain to listeners what body brokering is? Yes. I mean, yeah. So there's, there's different forms of it. I mean, there's different ways, all kinds of like methods for it. Um, I'll give a few examples. So 
I could have a treatment center and I could have a kid come in, you know, and somebody could go talk to him and be like, Hey, here's the deal. Like, I'll give you a thousand bucks. If you put you in a room, I'll feed you. You go to this room, you AMA out of here, you go to this room, you get high, you come back, you piss dirty. Once I collect the money from the insurance, I'll give you a thousand bucks. That's body brokering. Um, or I could be like, Hey, why don't you, here's what we're going to do. You can go up here, you can get this sublocate injection. And once I get paid off, I'll break you off. Or then they'll be like, tell your friends, bring your friends here. And a lot of times they'll like pay for the plane. They'll, they'll play for the plane ticket and shit like that. So they'll get these people from all over and just fly them out there. And then a lot of times like what happens is they'll keep doing this shit, like running them through billing insurance, billing insurance, billing insurance. And then the insurance turns. So no more, they're not paying for treatment no more. And then it's like out the door on the street. That's so, horrible. Yeah. So the movie, uh, the movie Body Brokers is pretty bang on. Hey. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah okay. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's some real shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I told but, my counselor, I actually told my counselor and I, I looked him in his eyes and I was like, dude, if I get body brokered right now, if I ever make it back, I'm going to punch you right in the throat. That's what I told, <laughs> so I, that's what I told him because I really thought I was being body brokered. I was like, oh my God. But it was just, too, it was just too good not to go. I was like, what's California, you know? So how was that experience? Um, oh, the treatment center was legit. You know what I mean? It was good. Like I loved it. I mean, they, they, they ran like a really fucking hard program, dude. Like it, like their program alone, like literally set me up for success down the road. Like, like, like hands down, like it, cause they just kept you so busy and it was like sink or swim pretty much. Like, I mean, they had, there was, there was structure, but they gave, they gave you enough rope to hang yourself, but it was just like really fucking intensive. That's sweet, man. So you obviously liked California once you got out there. So oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. Yeah, the weather's perfect. Um, there's, I mean, you could, if you're like an active person, you can do anything you want to do out here. You can go snowboarding, you can ride dirt bikes, you can surf, you can skate, you know, fish. Anything you want to do, you can do it out here. And, and I like doing stuff like that. So it's like perfect. You know, fast forward from there, Nate, how did uh, how did you get so involved in the community? Yeah, so there was this, I mean, so I survived some overdoses uh, from opiates in my day. And, um, but the main thing, so here's, I'll give you, the, can I give you the backstory? So I think that's oh, important. Yeah. So, so the backstory is, um, it was 2018, right before I went to treatment, or actually it was right before I went to the trap house. Um, but I'm getting high and this other dude's getting high and I, uh, it's in March. So we're like watching the NCAA tournament downstairs and I go upstairs to find him. And this motherfucker is like, just slumped like this. Like he doesn't even have, his head doesn't even have a nod. He's not even nodding. He's just like, mm. and he's purple. And I'm like, what the fuck? And this dude just got out of prison. Like, I don't know. He just, he'd been in a prison before and just like got out recently. And um, I was like, well, fuck. And because I'm holding, I knew he had shit on him. And, um, and I was like, well, do I call 911? And, and like, well, will I be a snitch if he goes to jail? I was like, what if he goes back to pri- you know, prison? And I was like, what if I go to jail? And I'm like, I'm just going to let him die. And like, just straight up was like, I'm walking the fuck out of here and pretending I didn't find him. And I was just like, and so I, I like walked around for a couple of minutes. There was no Narcan in the house um, that I knew of. And um, I was like, all right. So I called 911 and then I like patted his pockets down to make like to try to feel for shit. And he had a, he had a point in his pocket. So I pulled the rig out and tossed it and he ended up living. Um, the, the dispatcher that, that I talked to did, had no idea what to fucking do. I had never experienced someone overdosing because I was always the motherfucker overdosing. You know what I mean? So I was like, what the fuck is this shit? And, um, and so anyway, that's like why I got involved because I didn't want like nobody to have my experience <laughs> or like my family's experience. Cause they, they see me overdose and, um, or like, you know, I didn't, so I didn't want, or I, or I didn't want people to be like me and be like, Oh fuck this dude. I'm out and just walk out the door. Um, so that's the backstory to it. Um, and so I got out here and I had seen, who was it? I had seen like the church, the church of safe injection. And then there's a place in Phoenix called, uh, the shot in the dark. I had seen their shit, um, on Instagram and, um, I think Facebook, honestly, and was just like, I want to do that. And so I sent emails for six months until I got in touch with these people. They started in and they started like, they trained me up and got me, you know, to where I could train. And then they just started giving me Narcan distribute. And then that's, that's how it started. That's awesome. Yeah, that is sweet. Um, so Nate, um, you know, for the listeners that don't, don't really know, can you kind of talk about Narcan, you know, what it is, how it works and uh, you know, where, where they can get it. 
Um, yeah, so Narcan is an opioid antagonist. Um, it's been around for decades. And um, now it's just, for the most part, it's widely accessible. Most people, they don't know where to get it, but it's fairly accessible um, if you know what you're doing. If you can use Google, you can, you can get a hold of Narcan pretty easily. But yeah, it's just an opioid antagonist. And what it does is, it, is so when we uh, ingest it into someone, it goes to the, into the brain and we have opioid receptors in our brain and it kicks the, it kicks the drugs, whatever you, the person puts in their body, if it's fentanyl or morphine or oxymorphone, whatever, it kicks the opioids off the receptors and attaches to it. And it's able to do that because um, Narcan has a stronger affinity to the receptors. And so it allows them to breathe again is what it does. If you have insurance, you might be able to go to the pharmacy. Um, you don't need a prescription and you might be able to get it relatively cheap. Um, if you don't have insurance, it could run you from like 80 to $120. Um, what I usually do is I, when people ask me this question all the time, they're like, where can I get Narcan? And I just Google, I'm like, where do you live? And they tell me. And I usually ask for a city. I'm like harm reduction services near Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's what I do. And I'm like, then I send them like my carry go. That's what I do. And um, you can find them at, at syringe exchange or just, you know, people that are like, like we do, you know, we do it. We're not a syringe exchange, but we do like policy work and we distribute Narcan. Um, we're mainly policy work, but we distribute Narcan. And I, and I just, I just distribute Narcan. And I'm, I'm learning more about policy um, per se now than ever, but you can um, go to next. I mean, if you're okay, I would say this, cause I don't want to deplete next distro supply, but if someone was actively using I would hit up next distro um, for sure. Um, I mail people Narcan sometimes if they hit me up, I'll just mail it to them. You know what I mean? Like I give a lot, most of mine goes out in the streets and stuff like that. But if people hit me up, I'll get it to them. You know what I mean? But a simple Google search of where you live will, will definitely find you some Narcan. Nate, what's your vision for like, would you like to see it in more stores or like out on the streets more or I mean, just readily available for people that need it like people like people on the streets can go into the store and ask for it or you know there's like a vending machine outside um that they can get you know what i mean or you know it's not 120 fucking dollars without insurance you know what i mean because i mean i don't want to keep doing this forever i mean i'm glad to keep doing it forever but if i keep doing it forever that means nothing's fucking changing does that does that mean, i hope that makes sense you know what i mean so it i hope like played sense yeah, I hope this can get this like, you know, the, the accessibility and the stigma just deteriorate and it's in schools, it's in colleges, it's on campuses and like it's slowly getting there. But you know what I mean? But like as we get there, like the situation involving like the drugs and like what they're getting cut with is like worse. You know what I mean? It's getting even worse now. And so like, yeah, I hope one day like I don't have to do this. You know, that's the ultimate vision. You know what I mean? I would like to see them uh, almost the same as we see first aid kits in like businesses yeah. and schools. They should be. They should be mandatory in a first aid kit. It should be <laughs> mandatory at every business. And like, I try to tell business owners that I'm like, okay, if you have a bar, right? Like, dude, they, so I'll tell you this, they fucking, they were doing Gordon Ramsay's, like his restaurant and they went and wiped the, the, the toilet with this fucking wipe and it'll turn blue if there's like cocaine residue on it and all the fucking bathrooms had cocaine residue on it and he was like what the fuck who does coke on a goddamn sunday or some shit like that <laughs> you know what i mean and so my point being like dude like a restaurant like motherfuckers are doing coke like the cooks and shit like that most of them you know so like if homeboy dies in your bathroom they're shutting your restaurant down and then everybody knows you had someone die in your restaurant you know what i mean like who wants that but people have this thought that like they're at liability for a lawsuit if they have that. And it's the dumbest shit ever. Like you're not at liability. It's so crazy. The That's like the restaurant thing is kind of, I don't know. I'm, I've done it in so many restaurants. I know. That's what like, I'm saying. Everybody like, I know has. <laughs> and especially, at, and especially at bars too. Like that should be like a main thing to have at like a bar or a nightclub or whatever. Yeah. It's so true. Cause people you, like owner owners think that they're like, they're enabling them or their, their messages that you can get high in my restaurant. You know what I mean? And that's just not it. You're, you're just saying that like you acknowledge that people use drugs and they may use drugs in your space and that you want to save their life. If it happens, you know what I mean? So yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's like the thought process behind it is insane absolutely man i couldn't agree more i'd like i'd like to see more attention to you know uh like the crisis of like opioids fentanyl and why do you think that like the media doesn't draw as much attention to that as it does like other other things 
like, and I'm not comparing, like, I'll compare even to like COVID. If you look at the amount of deaths and compare them, you know, you kind of know what I'm getting at. Yeah. I mean, well, I feel like COVID gets like more attention, honestly, when people talk about it, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, absolutely. maybe they put it out there. I mean, I don't really know an exact answer to that question, to be honest with you. But maybe, I mean, I feel like they're slowly getting there, but I feel like, I mean, honestly, I feel like a lot of people just don't give a fuck about it. If you want my honest to God truth, you know what I mean? Cause most people wish that people like us would die. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh fuck them. Just let them go kill themselves. You know, Darwin's theory, Ugh. you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Darwinism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not I wrong. Mean, yeah, I know. I mean, seriously, Good point. you know yeah. what I, I mean? And those are the kind of people that will like argue something with you, but have no like uh, degree in it. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, let's let's talk about science and have no degree in science. You know? Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, I got I only got one more question for you, and it's about uh, humanity showers and how you got involved with that and kind of why. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's fucking wicked. Yeah. So. Um, what was I doing? So I did it. How this happened was um, I got hit up by who, who the fuck was it? So, uh, yeah, I was I was going through a really fucking hard time. OK, let me tell you a backstory. Can I tell you a backstory? Is that cool? OK, yeah. so I have this video on my it's on my Instagram now. And it's one from when I first got sober and I'm just like recording myself. It's on like some podcast app. I don't even know what the fuck it's called now, but it's still around. And I'm just like talking to just like air my thoughts out. And so I'm talking and I'm like, I want to give out Narcan and I want to give out like, like syringes or like uh, hygiene kits and like wound care stuff. So I like, I'm literally three years ago, almost no, it's like, right. It's like four years ago now. It's like four years. And I'm literally speaking into existence what I'm about to tell you. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I, um, I would go into a really hard time and I was like, you know, I want to give back more to my community. And so I'm trying to like, source like hygiene stuff so I can make kids and like do all this stuff and um and I'm like trying to figure out how to do wound care and stuff like that and then um and then I reached out to this foundation called the Lucky Duck Foundation they put me in touch with Vanessa Graciano who runs like Oceanside Homeless Resources and she's like she didn't have really anything to offer me but she was like hey you can come do a Narcan training and then I go there do the Narcan training give out all this Narcan I think they saved like five or six lives with Narcan I gave them um and then this girl Bianca was like, Hey, they want you to come down to showers. They've been asking about you. And I'm like, all right. And so I get off work that next Sunday, at like 11, 12 in the morning, I get home, get like four hours of sleep. I show up, I meet Jordan and then we just connected. And then I've just been showing up ever since. Like, I was just like, I, this is what I'm supposed to be because he was doing everything that I was trying to do. And I was like, okay, I'm just supposed to be here. And I just, hung around you know what I mean I just like kept showing up like every day because there was such a need for it and I was like nobody asked me to do it I wasn't getting paid to do it I was just like there's a need to do this and I'm just gonna show the fuck up and do it you know what I mean and I rearranged my life just to do that that's awesome yeah that's um cool, man. I got a two questions okay one we had <laughs> kind of a stupid question but uh we had a guest on I think a few episodes ago and uh, he overcame an opiate addiction, but he used the term "the nod father." The I thought nod it was father. The nod father. I was thought it was kind of funny. I was wondering if you've heard that. I have never heard that, but I think that is fucking amazing. To be honest with you, <laughs> like I, I like I might steal that honestly. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I that's... thought that, I I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. No, yeah. I love I love morbid humor. Like there is like that is what. <laughs> that is what gets me like through what I do. Like it, it like the more fucked up it is, the better. <laughs> <laughs> and then also um, if you want to share a little bit about your GoFundMe page and we'll uh, put the link in the description too on this video. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the GoFundMe just, it just helps me travel or like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but gas is like six fucking dollars a gallon. <laughs> and so I just drove to LA and back. And oh my God, dude, I was like, fuck. So it helps me with gas. Um, yeah. Um, it helps me, you know, like uh, if I need it, it helps with gas. You know, I try not to dip into it. Um, but the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is to like get a van. I want to get a van. I want to gut it. And I want to turn it into like a mobile, like, like Narcan van 
or or Nodfather van or like what? <laughs> I may, maybe that's what I'll call the van. I'll just like call it the Nodfather and break the champagne bottle. Uh, and and uh, fucking. Um, but yeah, I want to do like wound care out of it, you know, gut it, like have some compartments, like have everything organized. So like I can go up to encampments, you know what I mean? And they can just like come in the van, they can chill, they can get doctored up, get what they fucking eat and just dip, you know what I mean? So just real quick and easy, you know, they don't have to walk somewhere to go get service. It's just like I go to them, you know what I mean? So that's the ultimate go. Cause a lot of times that's what it is. You know, you have to go to people like they just, people want to sit around, they expect them to come to you or something in life. And that's just not how it works. Like you have to go to it. <laughs> It's incredible, man. I was just curious on too, like, you know, Mark talked about, you know, you inspiring a little bit to do, to do some work and, and obviously you're doing uh, really good things for people in need, but when you're doing things like the showers and, and stuff like that in the community, do you see, do you get a lot of people that, um, you know, maybe change, change people's, you know, views on, uh, on homelessness or, you know, coming around a little bit more to, to help and, and check out what, what you're all about? Yeah, we definitely, so like, um i know that people definitely hit me up on social media a lot to like come out they're like oh this like i get more positive feedback than i do negative feedback on social media you know what i mean um people are like where is this at this is fucking awesome how do i do this how can we make this happen or you know i had this one girl she hit me up but she was like do you need a barber or a stylist and i was like yeah just show up and so when she they 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 interviewed her like jordan and them did a video on her um and she was like, yeah, I used to be one of those people that judge homeless, like people that are on the streets. I judge them. I judge drug addicts. I didn't like them. And she like, and she was like, this completely like changed my experience and like what I thought about it. I mean, completely just like, she had to completely switch. She showed up again. She came back, she came back, cut hair again. And she committed to doing it like once a month or maybe twice a month. And so it completely changed like her perspective on it. And it, and it totally can like most people, most people just see what they see on the streets, right? They have no idea. Most people don't know the statistics behind this. Like most people, I don't know. I don't know anything about Canada. I don't know the statistics, but most Americans are just two paychecks away from being on the streets. You know what I mean? Most people don't know that. You know what I mean? And like right now, we're the richest that we've ever been in society, right? Like, you know, Elon Musk and Bezos and all that shit. But we're also the poorest we've ever been in society too. You know, a lot of people don't know that. And a lot of this stuff is like recidivism. A lot of, and, and a lot of homelessness is generational. So, and then if you look at it from a neuroscience perspective, neuroscience says that we are products of our environment. So if I've lived on the streets my whole life, that's what I'm comfortable with. That's what I'm going to do. Cause it's easier for me to be, to live in something familiar than to go off the ropes and do something different. But a lot of people just do not understand that. Speaking of myths, I seen uh, one day you were like kind of going in on myths of fentanyl. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I get so, Oh man, I get, I get lit. Yeah. yeah. I get super. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about some of those myths? Cause yeah, you can't, me, you can't fucking die from touching fentanyl. <laughs> and like, to me, knowing that could save lives. Yeah. You can't die. So your skin, your skin is amenable. Um, which means like, fentanyl, like it's super hard. Like you would have to hold a fucking, you would, I mean, your goddamn arm would fall off by the time it, you, you like enough fentanyl is absorbed into your body for you to die. Like your arm would like literally fall off. Um, I mean, so essentially like within these videos of like these police officers or whoever the fuck it is that are overdosing from accidental fentanyl contact, they're not actually overdosing. Um, they're having an anxiety attack. So they have the opposite symptoms of someone experiencing an opioid overdose. They're like sweating. Their heart is racing. You know what I mean? Their pupils are not pinpoint. Um, you know what I mean? So they're so nervous due to like the, the the propaganda that's out here the misinformation that like once they get around it um that they just they they have an anxiety attack um you know and so that's so all the symptoms if you look at it uh it's not what they don't present the symptoms of an opioid overdose and so like to explain it so your skin is amenable right so like it's really hard to get a substance to penetrate through the skin and so they have what they call is like a transdermal patch. So I could cover the bilateral palmar surface of my hand right here with like patches and, and like, I don't know, 30, 30 minutes, I might get 200 micrograms into, into my system. It takes a million micrograms to make one gram. So like, I'm not going to do the math, but it's going to take a long fucking time to get a lethal dose of fucking fentanyl through transdermal patch. Um, 
And then so like, I mean, there's videos out there, fuck, like Chad Skabora. I don't know if you know who this guy is. He's a fucking legend. It was like a couple of years ago. He literally like tested fentanyl. He, I think he was like one of the first people to do it. He tested it and like with a strip tested it. He's like holding powder out in his hand like that. Like, you know what I mean? So it can't get through. It's like, it's, you're not going to die from touching it. Um, you know, what else is like breathing it, all that shit. You can be in a room. It can be airborne in a room and you could, you could be in the room with no PPE on um, for like a long time. I think like in 200 minutes, you might get, um, you might get like a, a couple hundred microgram dose just from being in a room where it's airborne. You know what I mean? So again, it takes a million micrograms to get a gram. So, you know, you're not going to die from that. Um, you're not going to die from, from rendering aid to someone who overdosed on fentanyl. Um, you know, it, it has to either, it has to get in your mucous membranes or shoot it. You know what I mean? Like straight to the vein. So it's just a myth. It's, it's fear-based. Like there's so many people out there that are credited doctors that, that excuse me that denounce it you know and if you're that fucking scared to like put your mouth to someone you can literally like put a bandana or a mask on um you know that we wore during covid you can i've seen i've seen people take like styrofoam cups poke holes in it and just stick it in their mouth and then breathe through it you know what i mean so i'm glad you cleared that up man because that and when you mentioned it like uh that really can save lives Right. Oh yeah, no, there's, there's people that like, won't. so here's, here's a stat for you. One in three fatal overdoses have bias in their spies. So how many of those people, they either didn't have Narcan uh, or they're afraid of like being accidentally exposed by some, because of some bullshit video they saw out there. You know what I mean? And like a lot of those videos were those cops of like overdose. They never released the fucking toxicology report. Never happened. You know what I mean? So it's just like, yeah. and to me, that's why I like, I like harm reduction so much for that. Like that reason man you can educate people and you can you know bring like i guess bring the correct information to people that can save lives and that's i think what it's all about really yeah no i do too that's what it should be about you know what i mean like just putting out the, the truth out there because a lot of people i don't know man miss like fear spreads faster than the truth i don't know if you've ever noticed that but it, it's so crazy yeah absolutely man um how's your uh, like relationship been with your family since uh you know, getting sober. Um, I went home. I was like, I don't, I don't know when it was. I went home and I made amends to him. Like I flew home and was like, oh, it was, it was a really good experience. I was like so nervous. I was like, they're probably going to tell me to go fuck myself, but um, <laughs> they did. They, they didn't. Yeah. I was, that's like what my head was going to tell me. I was like, I'm spending thousands of dollars for my family just to go tell me to go fuck myself. You know, um, that's like what my head was saying. And, <laughs> but I went home and it was, it was good. They're like, oh, we're just, this is what they told me. This is what my dad told me. I swear to God. And my dad was against me going to California. He was like, oh, what are you going to do in California? You know, like he sounded like boom power when he said it. Cause we have like those accents and shit. And, uh, but I got there and he was like, listen, son, he was like, I'm not mad at you. You're doing real good. He's like, but you can never fucking live here again. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I was like, all right, <laughs> that's pretty fair. And he, he did, he didn't mean like, I couldn't like stay at his house. He just like, you could never live in this fucking town again. And I was like, okay, that's fair. I can do that. <laughs> And, um, and the, oh man, I had to tell him, I had to admit to him that I brought bed bugs into the house, um, which was like, that was really fucking bad. Like getting rid of bed bugs is really expensive. And like, we had a falling out over it because they like called me out on it. Or I was like, no, nah, you guys fucking brought in the bed bugs and walked out, slammed the door. It just was real dramatic about it. And I was just like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> and so but i squashed it and like i apologized you know i was like dude i you know i was like how can i write this is there anything more i need to apologize for i was like like what do you need from me i was like do you want money i'll give you money he's like no no just to go do this like i was like all right he was like you know so we squashed it um and so we talk we don't talk every day um because my i'm busy my dad's busy but we talk regularly like we're on good relationship like we have a good like relationship i would say for sure good stuff man Good. Um, fellas, we got any more questions from Nate? No, man, that was that was awesome, awesome to uh, to listen to. To be honest, I it was pretty good education for myself, to be quite honest. So I was just kind of all ears listening to that. It was cool. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah I'm glad you glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Nate. You're an inspiration. Honestly. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks that. again for joining us, man. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it was a blast, dude. Thanks a million. Uh, oh, you're welcome. All right, I'll take us out. Guys, if you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please reach out and ask for help. Thanks for listening.